The entire apartment smelled like cigarettes and dirty dishes. Doc knew she should get up and clean, but what was the point? Even though her ashtray was overflowing, she could still fit a cigarette or two in there. The dishes had been there for a week, but there were still a few clean ones left to use. She'd put them in the dishwasher eventually. There was no need to get up and do it now. The woman stared up at the ceiling as she laid on her old and frankly uncomfortable couch. Smoke wafted up lazily from the cigarette in her hand. She almost forgot it was even there. The light from the street came in through the blinds, streaking across the ceiling and opposite wall. It lit up every time a car went by, dragging quickly from one side of the room to the other. Her upstairs neighbors were already up. They worked just as early as she did. She could hear them stomping around above her as they got ready for the daily grind. A soft beep sounded from her kitchen as the coffee pot turned itself on. Meanwhile, the clock beside her flipped to 4 a.m. with a soft clicking noise. Every time she looked at it, she felt the need to throw the damn thing out the window. The way the numbers fell with every minute that passed only reminded her of just how quickly time flew by, how quickly things were lost. Doc pushed herself up from the couch with a groan and shoved off the blanket that had been keeping her warm all night. Being in something as small as a studio apartment made it easy enough for her to get to the bathroom to shower. There was no ashtray in there, so she just pressed the burning paper and tobacco against the wall to put it out. There was no way she was getting her deposit back. Not that it mattered much to her. She made enough that affording her bills was no problem, and she was already set to be in this place for a good five years at least. The cigarette fell on the floor as she dropped it, joining a pile of others beside her now growing pile of clothing. The water of the shower was hot enough that it should have washed away everything, but no matter how much she scrubbed herself, she always felt dirty. Even now, as she used a loofah against her dark skin, nothing ever felt like enough. The only thing she was thankful for at this point was that her hair wasn't falling out, despite how roughly she washed it. Her towel was clean enough, she'd taken it out of the wash just two days ago. It was funny how badly she wanted to clean, but nothing else in her apartment mattered. However, the apathy began to kick in once more, and she found herself not caring enough to try and figure it out. As she made her way out of the shower, another sound reached her ears. The little one upstairs was now awake, and she could hear the pitter-pattering of their little feet running around as their parents got ready for work. Doc closed her eyes and leaned against the doorframe, letting her wet hair drip down her body and onto the carpet. In that moment, all she could bring herself to do was close her eyes and listen. God, she missed that sound. The memories of her own little girl flooded back to her. The way Cella would run around used to make her heart sore. Now the mere thought of her made the technician's heart ache. But she wouldn't give for just one more minute with her. The smell of the coffee reached her senses, reminding her of the mornings her husband would get up early just to make her a warm and bitter drink. The way the smell of breakfast would waft into their room as she would shift in their soft and inviting sheets always made her feel so happy and at home. Even her husband's scent against the pillows was something she loved so much, but had taken for granted. Chella's laughter, her husband's smile, and the way they all fit so perfectly together were the only memories that could bring her warmth to her chest. A loud screech outside was enough to pull her from her few happy thoughts. The sound of screaming tires launched Doc from warm memories into a nightmarish hellscape that she could never seem to escape. Flashes of car lights and the sound of a devastating crunch flew through her mind. She could feel the impact. She could smell the burnt tires, metal, and hot asphalt. The terror of waking up completely upside down, feeling the warmth of blood that wasn't hers leaking down her arm, all hit her so hard that she had to gasp for air. All Doc wanted to do was crouch and hold her head as she remembered seeing her daughter's lifeless body in the back seat. Her husband wasn't her husband anymore. He was simply a lifeless husk without a head. Even as she scrambled into the bathroom to try and find her anxiety medication, Doc could hear her own pained screams as she remembered trying to reach for her daughter. She'd tried to call her name. She'd screamed for her. She had done everything she could. But she was gone. Doc wheezed for breath as she leaned over her bathroom sink. The mere thought of everything made her want to be sick. Unfortunately, she had to hold it all in if she wanted the medication she'd just swallowed to work. Her entire body was shaking. She couldn't feel the wetness on her skin anymore. She couldn't even move. The technician simply had to stand there and wait it all out. Time ticked on endlessly, each second feeling like three years as it dragged by. Eventually, she was able to move her leg again. Then the other. 
Again and again, she managed to move her legs until she was finally walking into the kitchen. It had been a long while since she had last had an episode like this, but she was back now, back in her little studio apartment with no warm bed, no breakfast, and no family. Her hand still shook as she poured her coffee, but she was determined to drink every drop of black goodness in the pot before she headed off to the shithole she called work. The only thing that broke her focus was her phone ringing. The number was unfamiliar, so she ignored it. Then it rang again. And again. With a grumble, Doc finally answered it on the fourth ring. The hell do you want? She asked, pulling her coffee to her lips to sip. Unfortunately, the news she was given was enough to make her choke and spit half of it out onto the counter. <laughs> they did what? Great. Another mess to clean up. God damn it. I'll be right there. The group wasn't sure what terrified them more, the fact that they knew Doc was indescribably angry, or the fact that she came in with no emotion whatsoever on her face. All three bots and Sure had been lined up on the workshop like children that had just broken the house rules, and much like a mother, the woman was sitting in her chair and staring them all down while she smoked. The ashes from the cigarette fell carelessly to the ground beside her as her gaze slowly shifted from one to the next. It didn't take a genius to see the wheels in her head were turning. Doc pulled the cigarette to her lips, taking a long drag of it, and slowly letting it out of her nose. She looked to Shura, much like an angered dragon contemplating who to eat first. Unfortunately for the painter, it seemed they would be the one her eyes zoned in on. You. Doc commanded, much quieter than usual. Start talking. Why were you here outside of business hours? Shura hesitated, unsure if she should even tell the woman why she'd been there. Would it get Fairy Floss in trouble? The last thing she wanted was for the poor bot's memories to be wiped because she'd made the decision to play along with her antics. The painter gave a soft whimper and glanced at the bots for help. They were here because of me. Fairy spoke up before anyone else could. Everyone was there because of me. She just needed help. Shura insisted hurriedly, making Doc raise a brow. There was something in her walls. We just wanted to figure out what it was. Proudly, Fairy held up Taki. She'd been holding the bot in her arms ever since the drive home and hadn't put him down, even for a moment. And we found it. Or rather him. A la mami. Taki said, smiling and waving at the woman. Sure, he could read the room and knew she was upset, but he couldn't help it. Being quirky was in his programming. No. Was all Doc said in response to him. The grumpy woman molded over for a moment before turning her gaze back to the rest of the group. And how the hell did a magical little journey through the forest turn into you four stealing a car? She demanded, her words dripping with sarcasm. See, the funny thing about that is... Zappy started, actively stepping in front of Mirage. We kinda had to? The shortest bot perked in surprise, looking up at Zappy's back. Was the taller one protecting them? They held Eerie tighter, unsure of how to feel about the moment. They'd been content with the idea of Zavi hating them forever. It was strange that he'd take the initiative to shift the blame away. It was a life or death situation. Eerie spoke up for them. At the time, we were all sure what was chasing us was dangerous, especially for Shura. Yeah, exactly. Taki even broke Shura's phone. Zavi fibbed, folding both sets of his arms. Hey. Taki protested. You threw it at me. The tallest bot gave a dramatic gasp, Whoa. clutching a hand to his own chest. As offended as he looked, Taki was telling the truth. He couldn't contest it. Deep down, Zavi knew Doc could check their memory for actual video footage of everything that had happened. He and Fairy for sure had those capabilities. Though he wasn't too sure about Mirage. It seemed like the smaller bot was missing lots of the things the two of them had as general capabilities. Mm -hmm. Doc hummed out unhappily. Look... I'm going to be frank with you all. This can't happen again. I don't really give a shit about what you all do, but you just caused a major lawsuit. The owner of that car is going to sue. There's no denying that. This is your only warning. You all screw up again, and the big boss will have me wiping your memories entirely and reprogramming you with new personalities. More obedient personalities. She couldn't allow them to learn from their mistakes as one would with a person. As much as it bothered her inside, Doc recognized that the company only saw them all as property. They were objects that could be bought, sold, and repurposed at any time. 
That uncomfortable feeling would have to be pushed down. This was business, nothing more. The technician couldn't afford to get personal with this. But you cannot do that! She insisted desperately. They are robots. Doc cut her off. They're robots. Property. Things. Items. Each word she spoke seemed to make all three of the bots flinch away from her. It was a harsh reminder. In the back of her mind, Doc thought about the fact that scientists might have gone too far with AI. These programs were simulating feelings far too well. It was like their formed personalities were actually human. They might as well have been at this point. They may just be robots, but they are far more human than you will ever be. Shura said in a tone far darker than anyone expected from her. The bite to her words made Doc's hand twitch and her cigarette fell from her grasp onto the ground. Shura, meanwhile, didn't wait around for a response. The artist took Zavi by the hand and pulled him away from their interrogation. This talk was over as far as she was concerned. Mirage watched Zavi and Shura go before their blank eyes fell upon the woman in her seat. Doc's face was still blank as ever, but the look in her eyes showed that she was visibly shaken. Her rough morning wasn't sitting well with her. I know you all own us, the puppet master started quietly. But we might behave better if you treated us like we had a say in things, even if we really don't. It was the only thing Mirage said before they too left, but it was impactful nonetheless. Doc was trying so hard to keep a wall between herself and everyone there at Star Palace that she didn't stop to consider anyone's feelings. She'd been under the impression that she didn't have to. If she was being honest with herself, it wasn't easy to take anyone else's feelings seriously. It was a defense mechanism that she had yet to outgrow. She gave a deep sigh as she was left in the room with only Fairy Floss and Taki. What? You're gonna scold me too? She asked, finally reaching down to pick up her dropped cigarette. No. Fairy responded. I actually have a request. A request? Doc raised a brow in interest, and even Taki found himself looking up at the bot from his place in her arms. The much larger bot tightened her grasp on him, holding him close. Admittedly, now she understood why Mirage was constantly carrying Eerie around with them. Her sense of anxiety was being dulled just enough to bring things up to the woman, simply because she was holding him. You see, I have a... She started, only to pause and laugh. <laughs> Why am I explaining it to you as though you don't know? You know that programming I have that makes me fall in love with whoever the lead is? Interesting. Doc had no idea if Fairy was cognizant of that program. Usually, bots didn't really know why they did what they did in matters of personality. I do. She said, finally taking another long hit of smoke. <sighs> it's a switch in your back. Why? Can you? Turn it off? Fairy asked hesitantly. Taki's eyes fell back on Doc as the woman gave a scoff. Turn it off? <laughs> she chuckled out. I'd have to remove the damn thing entirely in my mess with your personality. It's fine the way it is. No. Fairy insisted. It isn't. It's getting in the way. Even when we all thought we were in danger and the two of them were fighting. She cut herself off, shaking her head frantically. Fairy Floss felt like she had no free will in those moments. Her mind and mechanical heart were being wrenched side to side, back and forth, endlessly in a loop that she didn't want. It was fine when it had just been on stage for short performances, but here? Here at Star Palace, it was constant. Every single time she was in the same room as both Zavi and Mirage and the two fought with each other, the program started to take over. It was leaking into every waking hour of the day. I can't take it anymore! She said desperately. Tough shit. Doc huffed, standing from her chair. I don't need to take it out, so I won't. <laughs> you want to be human so bad? The technician dropped her cigarette on the floor, stomping it out with malice. She was tired of this conversation. She was tired of it all. Fuck work today. Doc was going home and cracking open a bottle of wine to drown her sorrows. Deal with it yourself. The woman's words rang in fairies' hearing receptors louder than a cathedral bell. How was she supposed to deal with things on her own if she didn't have her own blueprints? She knew how to do minor maintenance on herself, but nothing major like that. Her grasp tightened harder and harder on Taki as she watched the woman walk away, so much so that the poor thing was left squirming in desperation. Fairy, fairy, I, I don't think I like this kind of squeezing. He wheezed out, or at the very least, he simulated a wheeze. It wasn't exactly like he needed to breathe. Sorry. 
Her long arms loosened and placed the tinier bot back on his feet. The last thing she wanted to do was break him. Still, she felt somehow empty inside without him there. Or perhaps it was all just the emotions hitting her at once. Everything felt like it was suddenly too much. She sat down on the work table with a loud thunk, her weight making it groan unhappily under her. Though her gaze was distant and it felt like she could no longer see him, Taki still wanted to help. The food service bot pulled himself up and into her lap, trying to get her attention. Is there anything I can do to help, mommy? He asked, tilting his head to the side. Fairy took a long moment to answer. So many thoughts were racing through her circuits. All in all, she had to weigh all the possibilities. What was better, letting herself be at the mercy of the program, or running the risk of completely rewriting who she was? Was she even herself if she was crushed under the heavy weight of being forced into emotions that didn't belong to her? Finally, she settled on a solution. Taki, will you help get this programming out of me? What? His shock was noted, but determination covered her features. She wasn't prepared to stop until she found a way to make this happen. If I can get you my blueprints and guide you through the process, will you help me and let me be me? She asked. Whoa, whoa, hold on a second. He protested, holding both of his hands up. I don't think that's a very good idea. I make food. I'm not a tech bot. Taki. Fairy said, seriously, reaching to grasp both of his cheeks tightly in her hands. I will do literally anything you ask me to do if you do this one thing for me. The last bit of Taki's smile melted away from his robotic features. The gears in his middle grinded uncomfortably. Something about all of this felt wrong. There was no way Taki would be able to do something as important as rooting through her system and doing whatever he needed to do in there. In fact, what did he need to do? Fairy? He started nervously. Maybe you should ask that tech lady for help. I know she's angry, but it's better than getting someone who has experience to do it. Oh, come on. I can't trust her to do it. Fairy said. She's just gonna say no. Or even worse, she's gonna shut me off and clear out my memory files. If she was being honest with herself, Fairy wasn't sure if Doc would do the things she threatened. She came across as all bark and no bite. However, it was best to not test something that calamitous. Taki fiddled with his own fingers, glancing around rapidly in an effort not to meet Fairy's gaze. He needed a moment to think everything through. There was a chance he could harm the taller bot's inner workings and break her, or that she could be wiped, and that he would lose the chance to be around her altogether. There was also the possibility that he could break her. They would fix her, but would still wipe her memory. The probability of this working felt too low to chance. Taki? Fairy said, reaching to grasp his chin. Everything's gonna be fine. I trust you. She crooned. You were rooting around in my walls for days. You can get into small places. Just like Doc said, there's just a piece you have to take out, and then everything should be fine. I know you can do this. Though he couldn't swallow, Taki gave a comical gulping sound effect. Part of him felt like he needed to do this. It seemed like it was the only thing that would make her happy. He had witnessed the behavior firsthand, both watching her through the vents and running after them in the forest. The way she twitched, the way she would switch personalities entirely, and the way she would hold herself once she'd managed to pull out of it. All of it looked so torturous. What does it feel like when your program takes over? He asked, legitimately curious. The question took Fairy aback, and she found herself looking away from him as she considered how to answer. It's like, I'm still seeing through my own eyes, but I can't control anything. Someone else's words are coming out of my mouth, and I don't even know who it is. Then it goes away, and I feel... There was a long moment of hesitation as she mulled it over. Her hand rotated as if to show the fact that she was thinking, when finally the word came. Embarrassed? Fairy asked more to herself than to him. Mortified? I don't even know. She let out a frustrated noise as she released his chin and sat all the way up. Did that even make sense? She wasn't supposed to be able to feel that kind of emotion. Technically, none of them were. They had specific jobs to do, and they should have been able to do them without wavering. This strange set of functions put together inside of her should have been so normal that she did them all without even thinking about it. The problem was, she was thinking about it. Constantly. It ate up every waking minute of the day for her. When was it going to happen again? How long did she have to be herself? The only thing that pulled her out of the thoughts swirling around inside of her was the sudden feeling of a hand reaching to touch her cheek. She blinked a few times before her sensors lowered to see Taki offering her a nervous smile. I'll do it, mummy. He agreed softly. I'll do it for you. Relief flooded through her circuits, and Fairy felt a genuine sense of happiness. 
With a determined nod, she turned to dig through all of Doc's paperwork. She was so excited that she left a whirlwind of papers and notes flying out of the filing cabinets in her wake. Taki, all the while, found himself following her slowly. If he'd had a gut, there would have been a horrible feeling in the pit of it. He dreaded the moment she found what she was looking for. Time felt simultaneously like it was moving too fast and like it was moving far too slow. He wanted this whole ordeal to be over with, but he also wished it would never come. A sense of what he assumed anxiety felt like rushed through his sensors as the ladybot finally found what she was looking for. She held it up in the air with a triumphant uh -huh. before turning to him with an excited grin. This was it. This was the moment he dreaded. Looks simple enough, she said, glancing over the paperwork. I was right. There's just a little piece inside of me that you can pull out. It's just a little switchy doohickey. Then it'll be off for good. So I can just switch it off? He asked, hopefully. No. She shook her head and his smile dropped. I want it all the way out. That way it can never be turned on again. Sides, Doc made it sound like it had to be taken out for this to work. I don't even know why they made it a switch if that's how it has to function. The tiny bot's arms shook with worry, but as Fairy reached to open the plate in her back, he tried to steady himself. The last thing she needed right now was shaky hands pushing their way inside of her. It'll be easy, she insisted. Look. Fairy held out the blueprint for him to see, pointing at the piece. That's what you want to get. You can't miss it, I promise. Just flip it off, unscrew the corners, and pull it right out. You should be able to take the two wires that are in it and just cap them off. Then I'll be right as rain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He agreed, trying to calm his non-existent nerves. Right as rain. Again, he found his hands shaking. Taki shook them both violently to get them to stop, steadying himself so that he could reach inside. Fairy leaned down more, trying to make it easier for him to see. There it was, the switch. It was funny to think that something so small could be causing such a big problem. The small bot made a strange noise as he flipped the switch into the off position. Fairy's entire body gave a tremble, and her head slumped forward slightly as relief flooded through her. D you okay? Taki asked, his voice squeaky from sheer anxiety. I'm fine. She noted. Better than ever, actually. You're doing good so far. Now, just... She paused, holding out a screwdriver for him. Gotta take it out. Three more steps to go. Unscrew it, pull it out, and cap the ends. He could do this. At least Fairy was sure he could, and that urged Taki on. He grasped the screwdriver in his little hand, allowing himself to keep going. Unscrewing things was easy enough. There was no way he could mess that up, right? He set each screw aside, finally feeling the piece come loose. Maybe he could do this. The food service bot found himself smiling as he grasped it and pulled, only for it to stop with a strange little clunk. What? He pulled it again, and again it seemed to be stuck. What happened? Fairy Floss asked, looking over her shoulder at him. It's nothing. I'm sure... Taki replied, smiling at her to attempt to hide his nervousness. It wasn't working. I can handle it. Taki yanked at it again, and then again, harder and harder each time. What was it stuck on? It was supposed to come out, wasn't it? That was what the blueprint said. You okay, sh A loud crack rang through the room as Taki finally managed to pry the piece loose. Unfortunately, his hand bashed against something else inside of her on the way out, and as he looked at her back in dread, he watched the much larger bot convulse in front of him before she slumped forward completely. Again, he gave a gasp. The piece clattered down on the floor, and Taki grasped Fairy's shoulders to shake her. Fairy? Fairy? Wake up! He all but begged. Please, oh, come on, you can't be. He couldn't even finish his sentence. What was he supposed to do if she was broken? The small bot grasped both sides of his head, his plastic teeth gritting together as he racked his mind for what to do. Doc was gone. There was no way he was getting a hold of her. He needed someone's help, and he needed them now. Would Zabby know what to do? Or Mirage? Sure was an artist, so they'd likely be no help. Who else knew about robotics in Star Palace? Taki ran in place, his little feet tapping loudly against the work table. He had just gotten to meet Fairy. He couldn't lose her now. The little bot was about to run outside to try and find some sort of assistance when suddenly the door into the maintenance bay burst open. In came a familiar redhead that he'd seen more than once wandering through the building. Wesley gasped for breath, trying to hold a tray with two coffees and a couple of breakfast sandwiches steady. Sorry I'm late! He called out, setting the tray down on the nearest desk. There was heavy traffic, and the line for breakfast was super long, and... Um... He looked around, whipping his head from side to side in confusion. Where was Doc? She was always there before him. Even on the days he attempted to get there early, the woman was always one step ahead of him. Where's Doc? He asked, looking at the shocked food service bot on the table. And 
who are you? Rather than answering, Taki's arms shot out to grasp the redhead's shoulders to yank him closer. Are you a mechanic? Taki asked, resuming his run in place. Uh, well, well, I'm kind of a mechanic. Wesley answered. Kind of? Taki questioned, raising a brow at the other. What do you mean, kind of? The bot shook his head, pushing the question away before Wesley could answer it. Never mind. Could you fix her? Wesley felt the grasp of the bot's hand against the underside of his chin, and his neck was wrenched so quickly that it hurt. He gave a wince, but looked over at what the bot was showing him. How the hell had he not noticed Fairy's lifeless body slumped forward on the work table? His body jolted in surprise, and he pulled out of Taki's grasp to look through the opening in her back. What did you do? He asked, squeaking out his words in worry. I only did what she told me to! Taki insisted. The smaller one rooted through the blueprints in panic, only stopping when he found the one she'd shown him. Taki held it up, pointing repeatedly at the piece she'd asked him to remove. There! This is it! This is what she asked me to take out. Wesley took the blueprints, trying to look over them as Taki let out a string of worried Spanish that he didn't understand. Truth be told, Wesley did know a small amount of Spanish, but the bot was going too fast, and the sight of the prince before him was making his head spin. The anxiety stewing in him made him feel like he was suddenly losing his ability to read. How was he supposed to do this without Doc there? The assistant set down the paper, looking into Fairy's back, and then turned his gaze to the part in question. Should he put it back? Should he call for help? What was the right choice here? He was so used to people telling him what to do that he felt a sense of absolute dread at needing to find someone to make the decision. But did he need someone else to make the decision? The ginger tried his best to slow his thoughts down. He closed his eyes, took a deep breath, and tried to center himself. He had learned a little bit of robotics from watching Doc do her work. She usually tried to swat him away, but if she wasn't going to teach him, the least he could do was try and learn. He'd also started tinkering with things at home in his own garage. It wasn't much, but maybe he was ready. All right, he breathed out, trying to be confident. Pass me the tools. The next couple of hours went by far slower than either of them felt comfortable with. Wesley wasn't willing to mess up, and Taki was too afraid to let him. The process was incredibly slow. Even still, he kept chugging forward, though occasionally Wesley had to swat Taki away to keep the worried bot out of his space. In the back of his mind, he did wonder if Fairy even knew what was going on. The state Fairy Floss was in felt like how humans described twilight sleep. She could hear things. Kind of. She could feel her body being moved around, but she couldn't see anything or react. The only thing the bot could seem to comprehend around her were muffled noises. They sounded so close and so far away at the same time. Part of her thought she could place them, but her circuits were not connecting well enough for her to figure out who they were. There was a spark, and Fairy could feel her body jolt. One voice panicked, and the other whimpered but tried to calm the first voice. What was going on? Why was everything dark? What happened? She wasn't sure how long she had been like that. Her internal clock seemed to be off now. Fairy did her best to count the seconds in her head, but every time she would lose track of the number. Each passing second felt like an eternity, until her body jolted up straight, and slowly she could feel all her processors starting up. Her head would twitch here and there as everything booted, and soon enough, she could see again. Oh, thank goodness you're all right. Wesley sighed. The bot didn't respond. She blinked a few times and looked around the room as if she'd never seen any of it before. That worried him. Normally, she would have spoken up by now. Are all right, aren't you? He asked. He was about to reach for the panel on her back again when her hand whizzed around to grasp his wrist. The sudden touch caused him to yelp, pulling his hand away. Of course, due to her stretchy arm, her hand just went along with it. At first, she didn't reply, but then one last jolt and shake into place had the last of her systems running. Well, hey there, she called, smiling to the two in the room with her. What I miss? All that mattered was that she was working and okay. Right? The realization hit Wesley so hard that he nearly felt dizzy. He'd done it. He'd fixed her all on his own. Sure, it was relatively simple. He'd just capped off some wires and done a little bit of rearranging, but he'd done it. He let out a soft laugh, reaching to push his hair away from his forehead in amazement. He'd finally been allowed to make his own decision. And he hadn't messed it up. Wow. He breathed out. There you! Before he could finish what he was saying, Taki sprung into action. The small bot outright shoved Wesley out of the way, causing the redhead to yelp, and jumped right into Fairy's lap. Fairy, you're okay! He yelled dramatically. Don't scare me like that, mamacita! While Wesley tried his best to regain his footing, he glared at the bot, only to stop and give a snort of laughter. The tiny mariachi was clutching his own chest, play-sobbing as though he was in a silly telenovela. 
The sudden contact was a bit of a surprise to Fairy Floss, but not an unwelcome one by any means. With a bright grin, her arms wrapped around Taki tightly, winding around their bodies more than once. I miss you so much! The smaller clown cried at the top of his lungs. Oh, hush now. Fairy soothed, reaching to stroke his hair. Surely I wasn't gone for that long, was I? <laughs> well, we've been working on you for about... Wesley paused to glance up at the clock on the wall. Two hours. Three. Taki corrected sadly. It took me an hour to find someone to come and help you. The time was more than worth it in Wesley's opinion. If Doc had been there, she probably would have fixed the whole thing in like 45 minutes. Maybe an hour tops. Then again, if she was here, she wouldn't have respected Fairy's wishes. It was only fair, wasn't it? If she didn't want that piece of programming and she didn't need it to perform her job there at Star Palace, then why bother putting it back in? The mechanical assistant felt a sense of pride welling up inside of him. He had done a good job, and for once he was giving himself a pat on the back for it. I'm all right, you little pudding pie. No need to worry about me. Fairy replied as she rocked Taki side to side in her grasp. The candy-colored bot wasn't showing it out loud, but there was a feeling of worry and guilt deep inside of her. She felt bad that the two of them had been anxious for three hours straight. I'm sorry if I made y'all worry, Fairy Floss said. I hate to be so much trouble. No, no, it's okay. The mechanic responded with a nervous chuckle. I'll make it up to you somehow, Fairy insisted. And you too. With those words, she turned down to look at Taki again, her arm stretching enough to boop him on his non-existent nose. Though I, I do admit, I feel a little woozy. She said quietly. Is that the right word for it? Woozy? Hmm, it must be your battery charge. Wesley pointed out. It was getting pretty low when we were working on you. I don't think you were fully off that whole time. So you were draining power without being active. Makes sense. She agreed. You should probably go back to your room and charge. The more she thought about it, the more Wesley was probably right. She hadn't refilled her battery since the night before. Their adventure had kept the entire group up and about nearly all night after all. Probably. Do you want to come too, sugar? She asked Taki. The smaller bot's head quickly snapped upwards to meet her eye to eye, and he nodded rapidly at her question. Even if Taki wanted to let go of her, his body refused to do so, not to mention the fact that Fairy was still holding him. Oh, that shouldn't be a question, Mommy. The mariachi cooed. At that moment, Taki came to a sudden realization. He quickly turned his head to face Wesley, as that was all he could really do while in the grasp of the tall lady bot. Wesley? You did good, amigo. Taki said, giving him a smile. Oh, and... Perdon if I got a little agitated back there. An apology and a thank you was the least the mariachi could do after Wesley had helped his favorite person in the entire world. You know, even if he had only known her for a few hours. D don't worry about it. Really, I'm happy to help. Wesley replied. And it's okay. I know we were both just stressed. He didn't take Taki's snappiness personally. The little bot was unused to what was going on and more worried than his circuits could handle. If anything, the ginger was just happy to have been there when everything happened. With a happy nod, all of Taki's attention flung back to the taller bot before him. The smaller animatronic looked up at her in adoration. There was something interesting in the way he gazed at her. None of the other bots did that. She felt special, like she actually mattered for once. After having been used as nothing more than a pretty prop in Star Palace, it felt good to have someone see her as more than an object. Even if that someone was another bot, a bright smile made its way across her face. Come on, Asuka. Let's get you all charged up. The mariachi said. With a smile, he stretched one of his hands enough to boop Fairy Floss, imitating her action from before. It warmed Wesley's heart to see the two of them making friends. Fairy stood, still cradling Taki in her arms, as she headed out of the maintenance bay. Though not before the group could give each other fond waves goodbye. Taki's comment finally set in, and Wesley felt himself beaming with pride. I did do good, didn't I? He asked himself. The mechanic looked down at the screwdriver in his hand, and with a confident flourish, twirled it in the air and caught it with a smile. If he could do this, he knew he could keep going. He would be a true robotic mechanic in no time.